Where did USA Today Sports rank the Oklahoma Sooners in their post-spring Big 12 power rankings? It wasn't number one. We'll talk about where on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to Locked On Sooners, and thank you for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. My buddy here is Josh Helmer. You can follow him on Twitter at Josh on Ref. You can also hear him Monday through Friday from 9 to noon on 94.7 The Ref in Norman. And special shout out to every member of the Everyday Club. Thanks for being here every single day with us here on Locked On Sooners. Josh, first thing we're going to talk about, USA Today post-spring power rankings. The Oklahoma Sooners came in at behind Texas at number one, behind Someone else at number two, the Oklahoma Sooners were number three, Josh. Coming in at number two were the Kansas State Wildcats. How do you feel about where USA Today has slotted the Oklahoma Sooners in in their post-spring power rankings? Well, if you are a member of the Everyday Club, you probably know that this is the right top three, according to one Josh Elmer. Yours truly, I think that they've got the the top three correct. Now, uh, in whatever order it winds up, We'll see. I think I would probably have the top two flip flopped as of right now. But, uh, you know, for me, I don't have a big problem with USA today feeling that uh, Oklahoma has a a little bit of a a prove it factor attached to them. I mean, there's still a ton of respect here for a team that John finished six and seven a season ago. There's a, a pretty significant belief from USA Today Sports that, okay, Oklahoma is going to right the ship to whatever degree that may be. And in finishing third, just be on the outside looking into the Big 12 championship if this power ranking is the ultimate gospel of how next season plays out. So to me, I don't have a big beef with Oklahoma not being uh, in the top two. I think that's just the price that you pay in the prediction season when, oh, by the way, the year before you were six and seven. Yeah, it seems reasonable, at least. We kind of know that Texas is going to go into this season as the favorite. It just seems like the writing's been on the wall since they had an improved season last year, bringing a lot of guys back, uh, especially the quarterback, top wide receiver, top tight end, uh, some defensive pieces as well. And they've continued to add to that roster through the transfer portal, through the recruiting rankings as well, or recruiting ranks as well. And, you know, Oklahoma being three, It does make sense. I can see an argument to be made for them to be number two ahead of Kansas State after losing guys like Deuce Vaughn and Felix and DK Uzoma. I mean, two really, really great players. Uh, At the same time, they keep in Will Howard. They still got Cooper Beebe. They've got a lot of really talented players returning. One of the best coaches in the conference and Chris Kleiman. So it's it's a reasonable top three. I think any way you want to put it, you would not, to me, be disrespecting any one of those schools. Uh, Again, I do think Texas is going to be the prohibitive favorite going into the season. And I I think Kansas State has a a case to be made as the number two team going into the season. Where Oklahoma's at, I think that's a pretty solid spot. Uh, Because if you look at who comes in behind Oklahoma, they got TCU as four. And we've talked on the everyday, you know, every day here, whenever we've covered uh, power rankings of these things, we both kind of think TCU is going to take a bit of a steep slide now they're expecting tcu to drop off from what they did a year ago but i think they fall back further than four coming in at number five is texas tech uh, and then beyond them which i I think texas tech could be the one team that's the if you want to find a surprise team in the conference this year i think texas tech could be that team that makes that you know tcu like jump or a baylor like jump that goes from kind of middle of the pack to the Big 12 title game. Again, bringing back a really good quarterback in Tyler Shuck, a, a program that's continually building right now. Uh, they've got a, some pieces to replace as well. They lost Tyree Wilson, a top 10 NFL draft pick. So th- they're going to have some some retooling to do as well. But they're on an upward trajectory as things are you know stand right now. Uh, and then you got coming in at number six, Baylor, which, man, I don't know what to think about Baylor right now. The They, you know, 
bad in, in Dave Aranda's first season, great in the second season, middle of the pack in the third season. Who are they? What are the Baylor Bears? Uh, then you got Central Florida, Cincinnati, Oklahoma State at number nine. BYU at 10, Houston 11, Kansas at 12, West Virginia 13, and Iowa State at 14. Were there any of those teams ranked 4 through 14 that you feel like maybe Eric Smith of USA Today Sports is missing on, either too high or too low? Well, I don't think Kansas is the third worst team in the Big 12 based strictly off the fact that I think they have one of the best quarterbacks uh, in the uh, in the big 12 with Jalen Daniels. So I would have Kansas higher up the uh, pecking order than that. I don't view, I, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't view Kansas in the light of TCU or Texas tech Baylor, that little group. I think uh, that's reasonable that that trio would be sort of the next perceived in line outside of, again, what I think, at least for me is uh, the top three going in on paper in Oklahoma, Texas and Kansas state. So I don't know that uh, outside of just, Kansas being way glaringly too far down the board. And honestly, Oklahoma State, you know, I've been kind of banging this drum with all due respect to Mike Gundy and what they've accomplished over the course of uh, the last decade or so. Man, I think Oklahoma State's a, a, a prime fallback type candidate uh, out of uh, the, the top half of the Big 12. I know they have them nine here, but I could see them even further down than that uh, when it's all said and done. Iowa State all the way in the cellar. I don't know if they're staying in the cellar this season, John, but uh, anybody that I feel just totally got slighted that should be considered a legitimate Big 12 title favorite, no, I don't see that beyond the top three. Yeah, I think you hit it with Kansas. They're they're the team that you, you look at the bottom four and you're like, okay, Kansas, really? Jalen Daniels, I mean, he's got a, a chance to put himself into a pretty significant quarterback conversation when it comes into the NFL draft, you know, in, in 2024. But again, what's the talent going to look like on the rest of the roster? That's going to be Kansas's question because we know they're not pulling, you know, top 25 recruiting classes at this point. They're still kind of floating along the bottom of the barrel of the big 12, as far as recruiting rankings go. But yeah, for Oklahoma state, I, I could see that flip flopping a little bit. I could see Oklahoma state being one of the bottom teams in the big 12, maybe a, a tick above West Virginia. I think Iowa state could make a jump, but yeah. And, and I'm going to not issue any respect to Oklahoma state and Mike Gundy and what they've done. You, you haven't really, I mean, you've been okay. You've been solid, but you've not been great. You've been good compared to other Oklahoma state teams in years past and 10 years, but what's that gotten you just a, a touch below, you know, a touch above mediocre, a little bit above average, good, great sometimes, but you've got a lot to prove this year going into the season banking on an Allen Bowman as your starter. That's not a great recipe for success. You, you kind of ran off arguably the most, you know, the best player that you've had since what Brandon Whedon or, or Mason Rudolph um, at the quarterback position in Spencer Sanders. And now you, who knows, man, this, this Oklahoma state team has had a ton of people transfer out. And I mean, they're banking on improving a defense that was not very good last year and hoping that that turns some things around. There's just so much unknown with the Big 12 going uh, into this season, even at the top, right? I, I'm sitting here telling you that Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas State, that's the top three. Well, you know, there's fair, legitimate questions to be had about everybody at, uh, at the top of the board here in what uh, USA Today has as its initial post-spring power rankings and probably anywhere you look. So it's a, it's a fascinating league from that standpoint that you don't kind of have that standard bearer program right now going into this next season yeah you've got kansas state as your defending big 12 champion but guess what deuce vaughn for a team like kansas state that's a massive piece to replace for kansas state and you just don't with kansas state have that same confidence that okay like and bear with me on this obviously but like a, a georgia or an ohio state or a michigan it's you, you don't feel as confident that that's a team built to just plug in play and, and reload as a conference champion. So there's some, some pretty legitimate questions. I think really just everywhere you look in the big 12 Baylor is a team that I don't know how to figure them out at all. John. Yeah. Blake shaven has got a ton of experience now, but again, they lost pieces on a defense that was not what it was supposed to be. I mean, again, Dave Aranda 
bad first season. You kind of write that off as first season, getting things installed. Great second season. They go and they win the big 12 last season when everybody's kind of expecting them to take another step forward and maybe become a national title contender. Again, a step back into middle of the pack for the big 12. So there are a lot of question marks up and down the big 12. We don't even really know how the new four are going to factor into this. I think most people are expecting them to be, you know, around the bottom half of the league in UCF, Houston, BYU, and Cincinnati. But man, you never know. Like one of these teams could catch fire, find their quarterback situation to be really, really strong, and then just make a run. Uh, depending on what the schedule looks like and favorable matchups and just the timing of certain games that that's going to be really intriguing to, to follow. And again, you look at an Iowa state team, if they had any semblance of solid to good quarterback play last year, they're flirting with eight, nine wins as a team. But because Hunter Deckers was just a turnover machine, just could not hold onto the football. Couldn't keep from getting sacks or sacked. They were not good because their offense wasn't good, but that defense was one of the best in the country. Oklahoma saw it front and center. Now they got dismantled a little bit, you know, in their final couple games, but for the first, what, I don't know, 10, 11 games of the season, they were really, really, really good. So if they can get any kind of like above average to good offense, that could be a force in the big 12 this year. So, I mean, again, a lot of question marks, Josh, what, what other thoughts did you have on this before we kind of turn the page? Well, as we begin to turn the page, I want to I want to delve a little further into the question that USA Today Sports' Eric Smith asked about Oklahoma. And it's uh, the question of really the offseason for Oklahoma. How do the Sooners respond to their first losing season of this century? And we've debated and discussed this, I think, plenty of times in the past, but it's worth revisiting as – USA Today Sports has labeled that Oklahoma's big question. So how do the Sooners respond to their first losing season? Let's discuss. But first, right now, hey, it's time for the fast break to FanDuel. The NBA playoffs, they're here right now. New customers, you get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. There's no better place to bet all of the playoff action than America's number one sports book. You've got an interesting, interesting couple of Western Conference playoff series in particular. One Eastern Conference playoff series, uh, I, you know, New York, Miami is interesting, but I'm really curious about Philly, Boston, how that's going to play out. But now all of a sudden, LeBron, Steph in the semis, uh, Denver grabbed that early lead over Kevin Durant and the Suns. So, hey, the NBA playoffs, they're here. It's exciting, and there's no better place to get in on all of the action than America's number one sports book. That's FanDuel. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. Again, FanDuel.com backslash locked on. FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. 21 and up in select states. First online real money wager only $10 deposit required refund issued as non withdrawable bonus bets that expire in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See full terms at fanduel.com slash sportsbook. Fanduel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with the Kansas star casino LLC gambling problem. Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Minnesota, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, and Virginia, or 1-800-NEXT-STEP or next step to 53342 in Arizona, 1-88-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700 or visit ksgamblinghelp.com in Kansas, 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana, gamblinghelplineema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts. Visit, fan, uh, sorry, visit www.mdgamblinghelp.org in Maryland. One eight seven seven eight hope and Y or text hope and Y to four, six, seven, three, six, nine in New York, one eight hundred five, two, two, four, seven, zero, zero in Wyoming, or visit www one dot one eight hundred gambler dot net in West Virginia. Okay, Josh, can the Oklahoma Sooners respond or how will they respond after their first losing season of the century? Well, we hope really well, <laughs> we hope with uh, a, fiery vengeance for the entirety of the big 12 schedule in what is uh, the final year 
in the conference. I agree with what uh, with what Eric uh, Smith wrote here. Here's just a little bit of uh, what Eric had to say. Brent Venables brought enthusiasm and a more physical approach. Results didn't follow. Oklahoma cratered after a 3-0 start. The bright side is that four losses were by three points. But for this team to get better, the defense has to get better play from the secondary, force more turnovers. Offense should be in good shape with Dylan Gabriel back at quarterback and a young group of running backs and receivers ready to step up. The schedule is also manageable, John, to keep the Sooners in contention if they avoid the errors that cost them games last year. So a couple of uh, things here with uh, how the Sooners respond to the first losing season of the century. I think probably uh, Captain no duh captain uh no brainer statement the first several games in big 12 play john feel as though they're paramount for this football team that road trip to cincinnati you know based on these power rankings that's right there smack dab middle of the road big 12 team which means not going to be a total walk in the park at cincinnati if in fact this is the eighth best team in the big 12 conference that remains to be seen but for oklahoma john a team that in some ways mentally still limps into this season based on the way that last year played out. They've got to got to play well at Cincinnati. Uh, I believe it's what Iowa state right after Cincinnati and then, and then on to uh, Texas. So those couple of games before the red river game feel, feel as though they're very, very important, especially when you got Eric Smith and others, myself, yourself that feel like, yes, the schedule is manageable, Oklahoma needs to make this schedule manageable, especially before it gets to that Texas game. Yeah, it is a manageable schedule. And I, I really like how it sets up for them early on. But again, you're going to get challenges from a Kevin Wilson, you know, coaching a Tulsa team that should be improved offensively, an SMU team that's been good offensively for the last several years. And then you got to go on the road and you got to play in Nypert Stadium. I know we've talked about it a lot. If you're part of the in it, the everyday club, you're probably tired of hearing me hearing me talk about the Nypert Stadium magic that's been going on over the last several years as a member of the American Athletic Conference. Like they've put together a really, really good home environment. That's part of the reason they got invited into the Big 12. It wasn't just because of the football success, it's because they've created a really strong program that has a great fan support and is going to show up whenever Oklahoma rolls into town uh in the what third, fourth weekend in September. So that's going to be a, a tough place to play, especially if they go that blackout route, which they're really good at pulling that off. So that's, I, I'm not saying that's going to be intimidating at all, but it just creates a whole different kind of level of hostility uh, for a road environment. And then you got Iowa state. It's a home game for you, but Iowa state at times has given you a little bit of trouble things. The last couple of years, even though you've gotten wins, the defense has been, difficult for Oklahoma to solve, whether it was Lincoln Riley and Caleb Williams or Jeff Levy and Dylan Gabriel, they had a hard time solving this Iowa state defense. They came away with wins and they were pretty convincing wins, but it wasn't like they, you know, just dominated it. It was, you know, a fast start um, with, you know, Jeff Levy and Dylan Gabriel, and then kind of just cruised in the second half to a win because Iowa state's offense couldn't do anything with Caleb Williams and Lincoln Riley. It was, you know, slow start and then they kind of picked it up in the second half but then iowa state's offense led by brock purdy and Brees hall and and uh oh, i can't remember the tight ends name for the life of me now um they they made a strong push at the end to try to tie the game but you had to have a couple big defensive plays to win that game so that iowa state game that's no walk in the park necessarily either even though you know, a lot of people are looking at Iowa State as one of the worst teams in the conference. That's not going to be an easy game by any stretch of the imagination. Remember, in 2021, you had to have the thick six. You got to have that Jalen Redman, you know, touchdown or fumble return for a touchdown to kind of get you going in the first half offensively there at the end of the half. Otherwise, it was it was tough sledding against the Cyclones. So that's not to say that they're going to be a great defense this year. I'm just saying that based on what we've seen in the previous two years, that defense has been difficult to solve for the Oklahoma Sooners. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a manageable schedule. What it comes down to, and Eric Smith touches on this is can Brent Venables, Ted Roof, Jay Valai, Todd Bates, Miguel Chavis, Brandon Hall, um, whoever else on the linebacker on the defensive side of the ball, can they improve this defense? I think most of us expect that they will, but how much will they improve? Will they improve enough to overcome some of the offensive turnover that we've seen with, you know, several guys being drafted, 
uh, this past weekend in Anton Harrison, Eric Gray, Marvin Mims, Wanye Morris. I mean, those are three guys or four guys that got drafted in the first five rounds of the draft. So you got to replace those guys. That's a lot of production out the door. Braden Willis drafted in the seventh round. Can the defensive improvement or can the offense, the offensive replacements, are they, is that all going to be enough for Oklahoma to jump up from six wins to nine wins, 10 wins? I think we're, we're all itching to find out. We're, we're dying to find out, but they're legit question marks. Replacing those pieces that you're talking about and the season didn't go well. So, you know, that is for some maybe going in a, I don't want to say a complete, complete rationale for pessimism, John, but it at least makes you consider being a little more cautious with uh, how things, how quickly Brent Venables and his staff will uh, turn this thing totally around. Again, the question, very simply, how did the Sooners respond to their first losing season of a century? John, I, I think they're going to respond with nine or more wins. And uh, I think ultimately that's probably what 2023 is most about for Oklahoma is do they respond with nine or more wins? Do they avoid the bottom completely falling out and this turning into panic central with Brent Venables and his staff of what does the future look like? Is this thing going to work out long term? And then again, does uh, does the defensive improvement happen? If you have those couple of things transpire this season, then yeah, everybody wants to win a Big 12 championship and to feel like, hey, this thing is expedited, right? <laughs> expedited shipping, please, as we head to the SEC in terms of championships uh, delivered to the doorstep. But if there's just, again, tangible progress, defense is improving, and obviously the bottom hasn't completely fallen out on this program, then, then by and large, I think people are going to mostly be happy. Well, and I want to say, what Desan McCullough said after the spring game, he was asked just kind of what was the mentality of the team like when he got there? And he said, this didn't look like a six and seven team mentally. Like they weren't walking around, hanging their heads. They were all still feeling really, really confident about the direction and the future of the program. So I think that says something. And then you add in a bunch of talent in a Desan McCullough, Rondo Bothroy, Trace Ford, Jacob Lacey, Davin Sears, Reggie Pearson, Kendall Dolby, Josiah Wagner, Makari Vickers, you know, and then you're getting these, the, this infusion of um, developed talent or developing talent with Jaron Canick, Kip Lewis, Kobe McKenzie, R. Mason Thomas. It, it's all coming. I won't say it's all coming together, but it's all getting to a point where, okay, we're seeing Brent Venable's, team and Brent Vettel's defense begin to take shape. Remember he was coaching with a lot of Alex Grinch's players and he would never criticize those guys openly or, or directly because it's just not the kind of guy that he was, but it matters to have guys that you think are going to be a good fit for your team and a good fit for your scheme. And we've seen the turnover. We talked a lot about, you know, or people across the, college football I've talked a lot about the turnover that Deion Sanders is experiencing out there at Colorado. Oklahoma is experiencing the same kind of turnover. It's just over a two year span where they've had a lot of dudes walk out the door, especially on defense. And they don't have many returning starters from the Lincoln Riley era at this point. So it's, it's building, it's growing. Things are going in the right direction. It's improving. Do we still have questions? Absolutely. But I think we both feel pretty confident that those questions are going to be answered in pretty short order. And I think even by the time we get to red river, like we're going to see that, okay, the 49, nothing team that we saw a year ago, that is not even close to the same team that this is going to be in 2023 when they go down to Dallas. Yeah. And you know, this is maybe a, this is a conversation for another day. Who knows? Maybe as soon as uh, the live show for the everyday club coming up uh, tomorrow, but uh, how does Oklahoma handle Texas? That that could be the question that you put in there for Oklahoma. I, I do think probably big picture, I, I like the question in the direction that Eric Smith took it, which is how does Oklahoma just generically, how does Oklahoma respond to its first legitimate season-long bit of hardship, John? I mean, I, I know 2014 was frustrating, but, I mean, this was this was bad, bad for Oklahoma. But, again – how does how does Oklahoma handle the Red River game? I mean, that's going to be massive for OU now and into the future of the the SEC. So that probably deserves some more long winded discussion at a later date. 
I'll just say no, no Bijan Robinson. So that gives me a little bit of optimism right there alone. Uh, but any, any takeaways from the draft this past weekend, Josh, we had five Oklahoma Sooners get drafted. Anton Harrison went in the first round of the Jacksonville Jaguars at number 27 overall. Marvin Mims went to the Denver Broncos. Dallas Cowboys, what are you doing? You passed on Marvin at 58. You're killing me. Uh, and then Eric, uh, Wani Morris went in the third round to the Kansas City Chiefs, a place that Anton Harrison was getting mocked to a lot in the first round. Uh, they got their tackle in, in Wanye. Uh, it's going to be good times there. And then uh, Eric Gray went uh, in the fifth round, I believe, uh, to the New York Giants, which pretty decent landing spot, backing up Saquon Barkley. And then Braden Willis went to arguably – the the best fit for any Oklahoma Sooner getting drafted going to the San Francisco 49ers in the seventh round. If anybody knows how to use an H back slash tight end, it's Kyle Shanahan and the San Francisco 49ers. They're going to put weight room Willie to work. Well, and they got Mr. Kittle a couple of uh, breather snaps, right? If everything works out for Braden Willis, which will make San Francisco 49er fans, I I think happy, right? It's like, hey, wait a second. I, we want as many snaps as we possibly can for George Kittle, but you also want to protect the tread on the tires there too. So that that makes sense for them. Uh, we we talked about Anton Harrison uh, to to in last week, so I'll start with Marvin Mims instead. I I really like the fit for Marvin Mims in Denver. Here's a franchise that offensively last season was a disaster, and it starts with the quarterback. It's not necessarily the the wide receivers entirely that I think Denver fans would point to. They like what they have with Jerry Judy. Uh, I don't know that anybody's totally on the outs with Cortland Sutton, though now because they drafted Marvin Mims, John, there's a lot of conversation. And I guess teams have already phoned Denver to see if they can, if Denver's looking to shop either of the two. I can't imagine they would shop Jerry Judy. I think that they're probably looking one-two punch. Jerry Judy and Marvin Mims, and I got to say, that's a nice little starting point. I think for Denver and having Jerry Judy as the, you know, quote unquote alpha in the room to start off with for Marvin Mims, I think is, is nice for him that it takes a little bit, alleviates a little bit of that pressure for Marvin Mims. And then we're going to see right about Russell Wilson. I mean, is this guy totally washed? Does he still have something left in the tank? He's lost weight this off season, which all of this probably too much on the Denver Broncos, but I like the fit for Marvin Mims in a situation to where, a, John, I don't think he has to come in and be regarded as this quote-unquote number one wide receiver. Maybe he develops into that. But, uh, you know, B, I, I, he's somewhere that, look, he's going to get the football thrown his way, I think, a bunch. Yeah, Russell Wilson's not shy about getting the ball deep. Just look at what Tyler Lockett did in Seattle when when Russ was still with the Seahawks. Like Tyler Lockett, Marvin Mims, very similar body types and very similar style playmakers. You know, Marvin's going to win with speed down the field. He'll make plays after the catch. I think that is a really, really nice fit for Marvin. And even if they do keep Cortland Sutton, Cortland Sutton as well, you got Jerry Judy, Cortland Sutton. They can work underneath into the intermediate routes, and you got Mims that can just create all kinds of havoc downfield. He's going to get a lot of open looks because people will pay so much attention on Jerry Judy in the, you know, the short to intermediate space. Uh, and then, yeah, again, Wani Morris, you know, he's not going to be a day one starter necessarily, but he's going to have an opportunity to go in and earn a role given that Kansas city just lost Orlando Brown to free agency to the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, and then again, I, I, I really like the fit with Eric Gray up at New York. You know, again, we talk about not having to go in and be the lead guy at the position right away. However, if the contract negotiations with Saquon Barkley don't end in a long-term deal, Eric Gray could be the future at the position for the, for the New York giants. Uh, Barkley's on the franchise tag right now. They'll have till mid July to come to an agreement on a long-term contract. I'm sure that they will, but in the event that they don't, he either has to play this year on the franchise tag and then potentially gets franchise tagged again in 2024's off season and go through the same rigmarole again uh, depending on what Barkley and his camp decide to do, if Barkley sits out of you know OTAs and mini camps and the first part of training camp, Eric Gray could get it. He has a chance to get a lot of first team reps uh, with the Giants' offense that is friendly for running backs. I think so. A good opportunity for him at least to to showcase early on if if Barkley sits out awaiting this contract negotiation. Well, and we've seen John. Running back is a position that, generally speaking, though this was a first round where two running backs got selected in the in first the top round. 15, no less. <laughs> right. Yeah. Very, very early, hyper early in the yeah. draft. That's sort of been uh, 
counter to what we've seen in recent years. Generally speaking, we're seeing teams value running backs less and less and less. And yet, I point you no further than Isaiah Pacheco with the Kansas City Chiefs uh, just uh, last season who comes in, seventh-round pick. He wows everybody. It's his job. So, and, and I know that you know Kansas City versus New York, there isn't a Saquon Barkley, or there wasn't in Kansas City. But all of a sudden, you know, somebody like a Clyde Edwards-Alaire that was there and that Kansas City did spend a first-round pick on, if that doesn't click or there's a contract negotiation, again, in the case of a Saquon Barkley that's not quite up to snuff or both sides aren't totally satisfied and all of a sudden Eric Gray gets his chance and he goes out there and shows that he can be productive, man, an NFL team in this day and age, John, they are (laughs) – Yes, they would like to pay the rookie deal instead of all the cash to Saquon Barkley. So not necessarily the the worst situation for Eric Gray at all. No, not at all. He's going to have an opportunity to show himself, especially because Brian Dable, they want to run the ball because they want to keep the ball out of Daniel Jones's hands. They don't want him throwing the ball a bunch because that is bad news bears for everybody involved. But we'll, we'll have so much more to talk about on our live show Monday night, 9 p.m. Central Time. we got to cover Oklahoma softball, won their 11th straight national title on the diamond, you know, sweeping the Kansas Jayhawks. They've still got a Big 12 series against, you know, Oklahoma State up there in Stillwater, but Big 12 titles already clinched for the regular season. We'll talk about that and so much more on the live show. So make sure you're subscribed to the show wherever you get your podcasts, but especially on YouTube if you want to be a part of the live show and a part of the chat room. That's always a lot of fun. We'll answer your questions, take your thoughts and your comments along the way as well. Subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Follow Josh on Twitter at Josh on Ref. Follow me at John Nine Williams. And the show is at Locked On Sooners. Follow the show on Facebook as well, Locked On Sooners Podcast. But until the live show, Monday night, 9 p.m. Central Time, he's Josh. I'm John. We'll talk to you then. Boomer Sooner.